Hello and welcome once again to Home Bible Study. From my home to your home, this is Robert Holler thanking you for taking the time to observe this video. And so appreciated is those that subscribe, view, comment, and respond. Today's topic, Satan's Christianity holds all Christians captive. Now this is a continuation of the war against Christianity. Now this is going to be presented and there's going to be a lot of scripture given in this video today because it's going to be God's word that is going to show you why a subject matter with a title called Satan's Christianity holds all Christians captive. And this video is going to be presented to you and a lot of the scripture you're going to hear for a lot of you, you will be familiar with if you study the Word of God or if you attend a church that so-called teaches a lot in their Christianity, in their Christian church from the Bible. But I caution you, you're going to see or you'll hear these verses in a whole different light. Because when you listen to your preachers, in your denominational churches of Christianity as Christians, you never get the word rightly divided, the word of truth, that is, rightly divided. You get it always mixed with law and grace. And, and this is going to show you from God's word now how Satan has all Christians held captive because of this. And how God's word in truth, when it is rightly divided and presented the way God commands it to be, will bring it to light and show you the lies of Satan's Christianity that holds all Christians captive. Now we're going to start off with rightly dividing the word of truth. It's a commandment of God. And we're going to start off in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we know from Scripture the word of truth here is the gospel of your salvation. That is found in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and that is verse 13. And I'll just read it to you. And verse 13 says this, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after the you have believed, you were ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, let's continue on, and I'm going to show you right off the get go here why Satan, Satan's Christianity, holds all Christians captive. And it's because of two entities. He has your minds blinded, and he's held you captive because of it. And the first place we're going to go to is 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says this, in verse 3, we'll start. Verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are blind. Verse 4, In whom the God of this world, which is Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. And a lot of you are thinking, well, I'm a Christian now. I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, so I have to be saved and a member of the body of Christ. You just hold your thought to yourself on that. We'll get back to that. And then let's finish with uh, 2 Timothy, ladies and gentlemen. Right after 1 Timothy, of course. And let's read what it says in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. And we'll start in verse 25. 25 says this. In meekness, instruct, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance 
to the acknowledging of the truth. Verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who has taken, who are taken captive by him at his will. Kind of sums up the uh, title of this video so far, doesn't it? Well, let's get into now why Satan's Christianity holds all Christians captive. First off, Christianity, the word, does not appear in the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, and you've heard me say this over and over and over again since the war on Christianity began. It's not a scriptural word even. It is a man-founded, man-made word that comes from Satan. So right off the bat, we're waging war on something that isn't even, should be considered a doctrinal issue from the scripture because it's not. It's a false doctrine. I don't fight against people. I fight against the establishment. I fight against not flesh and blood. And I'm going to reiterate that to you. And let's go to the book of Ephesians, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 6. I told you you're going to get a lot of scripture today in this study. Ephesians chapter 6. And let's start in verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. So our battle is spiritual, not of the flesh and blood. With that being said, let's look at how Satan's Christianity holds all Christians captive. And we're going to start in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then we're going to look at some parts uh, of that, and then also into the book of the books of Romans to Philemon, because we're going to look at law and we're going to look at grace. You see, Satan's Christianity always has people that are captive, held captive by him, listening to law and grace, and has the pastors and the denominations and the religion of Christianity always mixing them together. There is no rightly dividing the word of truth in Satan's Christianity. Because when you rightly divide the word of truth, you expose the truth. You dissect the truth. You go below the surface and you see the truth exposes all of the lies of Satan's Christianity. And if you look back, and I, you know, there's nothing more appealing, I would imagine, to some Christians out there especially fanatical Christians, the diehards, that would love to reinstate, if you will, the Levitical laws, at least some of them, into today's realm. I'm sure they wouldn't have a problem if it wasn't against the law to go out and stone people that have had abortions or people that hold up signs contrary to what their belief is and have them stoned to death. Even other denominationals that's separated from one to another. There is so much division in Christianity, in Satan's Christianity. There is so much confusion in Satan's Christianity. There is absolutely no unity. There, it is full of controversy all the time. When one thinks they have it right, they split away from another one because they have different beliefs. Oh, times have changed. Cultures have changed. We have to go with the flow, so to speak. That's Satan's Christianity today. And people, like I said, would love to have these Old Testament rules and laws put into place for a lot of the things they disagree with, what the cultures tend to agree with and promote. It goes against their core beliefs of Satan's Christianity, see, and they want to see justice being done especially in the name of God, of course, and of Jesus Christ. That's Satan's Christianity, because we're going to show you, because I'm going to give you a lot of teachings of what Jesus Christ taught on his earthly ministry that was under the law, that was meant to stay under the law, and it was meant for the nation of Israel. There was no Gentiles 
included in here. And this has to do with the times past. Because we looked at that in a previous video about the divisions of the cross. You had the times past, the but now, and the ages to come. We're looking now at the times past for the nation of Israel exclusively. First and foremost, it was, it was going to be up to the nation of Israel and the apostles to carry out this gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ's message under the law to the world, which included all the Gentiles eventually, while it never came to fruition. And we know the commandment that he gave his apostles in Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 19 and 20. And it's been repeated many times, and I ask you to go there and look at it so you understand what his command was and to who it was to. You don't see any Gentiles mentioned in there yet. It said to go to all nations. That's what he's talking about. But he told them in the book of Acts, chapter 1, you start in Jerusalem. Convert everybody in Jerusalem, all the Jews first. And then you go into Judea and convert all the Jews there also. And then you move out into Samaria and the outermost parts of the earth to present the gospel of the kingdom. Well, that never happened. But Satan's Christianity tells you that commandment of Jesus Christ under the gospel of the kingdom that was under the law is for you today to continue to finish as his Christians under Satan's Christianity because you're held captive by him. You know, Jesus in his earthly ministry was very, very stern with a lot of times with his people. And he attacked the religious leaders. People might say, well, Bob, why do you attack Christianity, the, re the biggest religion of the world? You wonder why? Because I see through God's word rightly divided, and he shows me and he teaches me the lies that Christianity promotes. And the biggest lie is the mixing of law and grace. Period. And they won't stop it. It's too large. But I will continue to fight the battles because Jesus Christ will ultimately win this war. So we fight on. But Jesus Christ has no problem con confronting the very religious leaders of his days. See, these are the people that thought they were doing the work of their God, the creator of all things, their Yahweh of the Old Testament, the I am of the Old Testament. That's what they thought, see, and they, they promoted everything, but they turned it into a man's religion because it was never meant to be a religion. It started out as a commandment from God to rule over a government of people, but mankind turned it into a religion, see, because they were always surrounded by paganistic religions as they conquered and moved throughout the Old Testament even when they were taken captive by paganistic, ungodly kingdoms, like Babylon, you read up in the Old Testament. So it's not impossible and it's not unrealistic, unrealistic to see why they developed this religion of the Jews. And, and they, were, they had hierarchies or they had levels of authority within their religion. You had the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, you had the members of the Sanhedrin. You had all these that did what it is. They thought they had believed what the word of God, what they had in the Torah, meant to them. And they told the people what to believe. Sound familiar? Then along comes Jesus Christ. And he is not one to mince words sometimes when he has something to say. And this is a lot of scripture here. And we're going to start in chapter 23 of Matthew, because here's where he denounces the religious leaders of the day. And I'm not going to go through and, ex and explain the scriptures. I'll let scripture do that for you, but I'm just going to read it to you. We'll start in verse 1. And then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples, saying, verse 2, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. 3. All therefore, whatsoever they bid, you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Verse 4, for they bind heavy burdens and grievances to be borne, 
and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Verse 5, but all their, one, their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylogacies and enlarge the borders of their garments. Verse 6, and love the uppermost parts of the room of feasts and of the chief seats in the synagogues. Verse 7, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. Verse 8, but be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, and even Christ, and all of ye are brethren. Then he goes on, and we'll start down here in verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself above shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, ye hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them which are in, entering to go in. This is Satan's Christianity today. Verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pre pretense, Make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Verse 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you can pass sea and, hand and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Verse 16, Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever shall swear by the gold on the temple, he is a debtor. Verse 17, ye fools and blind, whether is greater, the gold for the temple or the sanctification of the gold. Verse 18, and whosoever shall swear by the altar, is it nothing? But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon the altar, he is guilty. Verse 19, ye fools and blind, for wh whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctify the gift. Verse 20, whosoever therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and all by all things thereon. And then he goes on and look what he says in verse 21, 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe to mind and to a, a, anus and cummins and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye not have done, and not to leave the others undone. Verse 24, ye blind guides which strain at a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Verse 25, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for ye made clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortions and excess. Verse 26, thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, then that which is on the outside of them may be clean also. Verse 27, woe unto you, you scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which are graves, which under, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all the uncleanliness. Even so, verse 28, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisies and iniquities. Verse 29, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Then he says, verse 32, Fill ye, fill ye up with the measures of your fathers. Verse 33, you serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He's telling the religious leaders all this. How are they going to escape the damnation of hell? How is Satan's Christianity and those leaders and those people that are called Christians that are held captive by Satan going to escape the damnations of hell? He says in verse 20, 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall be scourged in your synagogues and persecuted them from city to city, 
Verse 35, then upon you may come all the righteous blood shed from the earth, from the blood of righteousness, Abel, unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Barachaeus, whom ye also slew between the temple and the altar. Verse 36, verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Pretty strong words. He's going after the religious leaders of the day, ladies and gentlemen, because of what they did with their religion. It's going to be no different with Satan's Christianity. Come to great white throne judgment. Because this is of the law. This doesn't pertain to the body of Christ church, which is of grace. But your Satan's Christianity that holds you captive as Christians tell you this, appear, this is also part and partial to your Christianity. Do you see the difference? Can you start to see why <coughs> Satan's Christianity is the most damis, dam, damnation of heresies and the Antichrist and cults, whatever you want to put to it, is out there destroying everyone that follows it because they are taken captive by him. And we're going to show you some more scripture here, ladies and gentlemen. This is in, uh, I believe, Luke. No, it's in John. Let's go to the book of John. Because John, he tells them something in the book of John. I just have to find it exactly where it's at. But he calls them, and I want to read the scripture to you, that they are of their father, the devil. It's in uh, John chapter 8, ladies and gentlemen. Now, he's, here he's confronting the Pharisees because they came to him and said, we are of our father, Abraham. And he goes on to tell them, well, if you were of your father, Abraham, true, you would not kill me. You would listen to me, yet you do not. I tell you things and you do not believe me. He said, and let's start. In verse 42, and Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceedeth forth and come from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Verse 43, Why do you not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. Verse 44, Ye are of the, your father the devil, and of the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abodeth not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Where he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Verse 45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not, but you will believe the lies of your father, the devil. Because why, ladies and gentlemen, you were born under a lie to begin with, of the knowledge of good and evil, born under sin without the Spirit of God in you. It's very easy to be captive, be taken captive by Satan and your minds being blinded. Because a lot of times, people that re, uh, claim to be Christians and follow Christianity and claim to be members of the body of Christ Church by believing the gospel by grace through faith, and, and that's it, but they still want to do all these works and they still want to listen to the Gospels and mix law and grace because Christianity does it all the time. It ends up to be vain words of no profit when you confess the Gospel of Jesus Christ that you think you're saved. You've believed in vain and it's words of no profit and it's vanity. And you're just finding out here all of what Jesus told these religious leaders who they were and why they were that way. And another big lie of Satan's Christianity has you as Christians believing you need to be born again. And we did. I've done a whole video on this, but we're going to do a little segment on this also to help conclude with why Satan has you captive in his Christianity. Let's go to John chapter 3. Now, here we're going to start in verse 1. There was a man of, a of the Pharisees, a religious leader of the Jews, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
Verse 2, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do those miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. So this Pharisee knew something and believed something the other Pharisees didn't. Now verse 4, Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man, well first Jesus said in verse 3, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now let's stop right there, because Christianity, a lot of times I've heard these people repeat this. They'll tell you, verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, it doesn't say that. All it says is to see the kingdom of God. And it's very important to understand this being born again, what it really means. And let's read the rest of the scripture. Verse 4, Nicodemus says, saith unto him, How can a man be born again when he is old? How can he enter the second time into his mother's womb to be born? He was thinking purely on the physical side here. In verse 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto, ye, unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now here he says something about being entered into the kingdom of God. He said in verse 3, To see the kingdom of God, you first must be born again. And then we'll finish up in verse 6. He said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto ye, ye must be born again. When he said in verse 3, chap, verse 3 of chapter 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, lest a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. They're talking about the spirituality of the kingdom of God, not the physicality of things. See, mankind can see things in the physical flesh, but if he doesn't have the spirit, and here in the gospel of the kingdom, they were to be born again of the spirit. To see the kingdom of God, which is also contains as much of a spiritual kingdom as it does a earthly kingdom. They had no problem to figure out the earthly kingdom of the new Jerusalem and the new world that was prophesied about, but they didn't have the spiritual insight of it. That's why they had to be born again in the spirit of God, not for anything else, had nothing to do with salvation. But it was a combination of being born of the spirit and of the flesh. And that's why of the flesh, when he went on to say in here about uh, verse 5, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So the flesh has to be born of the water. That's where water baptism for the gospel of the kingdom is a necessity for salvation. And that should end all argument, debate, controversy about water baptism. It is for the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ under the law to be born so that the new flesh will enter into the kingdom of of God on the new Jerusalem to live forever in an eternal fleshly body. But see, the problem with them is they had to work for it. They had to have soul salvation too. They had to endure unto the end. They had to keep the commandments. They had to do all this works to include being physically baptized. That's what works. Something Christianity, Satan's Christianity tells you, you must be born again and you should be baptized. It's not all some denominations that split away absolutely believe you must have water baptism for your salvation. Others say, no, it is a witness thing. Both are wrong. Not from me, but from the word of God, because nowhere in this word of the 31,102 verses can you find a scripture that says you're to be baptized by water as a witness to the world and to your fellow Christians that you're a Christian and that you have been reborn as a new creature in Christ. You're just witnessing this through the water baptism. There isn't even scripture for this. The scripture does not say anything about that. But it does talk about water baptism for salvation because you can use chapter 2 of uh, uh, second uh, book of Acts, verse 38. But you have to look at verse 38, and it's in contrary to what verse 19 says in chapter 28 of Matthew, because he tells his fellow Jews now before there's no Gentiles here. And see, this is the interesting thing. In chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verse 38, 
is for the Jews only. And they must repent and be baptized, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, and they shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Period. There's no Gentiles there yet. Because there was Peter telling the Jews, and he was to continue first in, the, in Jerusalem, Judea, and then Samaria. And then that applies to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where he says, Go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Because you realize, once you read verse 38 in, second, in chapter 2 of Acts, he doesn't talk about God the Father or the Holy Spirit. He just has them baptized in one, Jesus Christ. Yet, Satan's Christianity teaches you that you must pick up the gauntlet here and carry out this, what Satan calls a great commission. It's not. It's a commandment. There's a dif difference. A commandment is a voice-given authoritarian rule to someone lower than them to carry out. A commission is a signed petition from a group of rulers for lower echelons to carry out. Big, big difference. Christian, Satan's Christianity doesn't teach you that, but Satan's Christianity does teach you that, oh, you have to apply Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, to carry on what Satan calls the Great Commission. And then you must baptize, and you must repent and be baptized, because that's what Peter said in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verse 38. And then you get so confused because... You're, you're going to find out in Romans 2, Philemon, which is a revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ. It was given to Paul fully in the but now of the cross is all spiritual under grace. There's no physicality here that you need to worry about because your salvation is solely based on a spiritual where your spirit is made alive in Christ Jesus. You're not born again. You're not out there for soul salvation. You don't have to endure to the end. And you sure as hell do not need to be water baptized for even a witness. Because you are baptized by the Holy Spirit of promise. That's how you are sealed once you believe. But you see, there's no unity in Satan's Christianity. There's division. There's controversy. There's all these things and these splitting and arguments and debates and what have you all the time. I can, you know, I talk to a lot of people and I try to talk to as many as I can. And so many of them tell me the same story in different ways, of course, but it all has a common denominator. I'm confused sometimes. I don't, I'm not getting out of my church what I feel I should be. There's something. Is there something wrong with me? But I, it doesn't add up. I've never felt fulfillment from the churches that I attended. And then I come across the video that has rightly dividing the word of truth, and I'm hearing and seeing things I've never heard or seen before. I hear that all the time. And there's a reason, because when you rightly divide the word of truth, you're giving the truth of the word of God. You're not watering it down. You're not changing anything to fit the ideologies and the doctrines of Satan's Christianity, see? I refuse to call it uh, Christianity as a religion of Jesus Christ. It is a religion of Satan. No doubt about it when you look at how successful he is at keeping people blinded in their minds, plus held captive by him at his will. Because if you go to the book of Ephesians again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you about the unity of the Spirit of God. And first of all, let's make a stop off in chapter 16 of the book of Romans and verses 25 and 26, because this is where you introduce to the revelation of the mystery. Verse 25 of Romans 16 says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, according to my gospel, Paul says, and to the preaching of Jesus Christ, not according to the gospel of the kingdom under the law, but according to the revelation of of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Jesus Christ's earthly ministry was prophesied about. Jesus Christ's gospel of the kingdom was known that it was coming, and he didn't hide any of that from anybody when he was on this earthly ministry, but he hid the gospel of the grace of God, the revelation of the mystery of Jesus Christ. He hid from everybody during his 
earthly ministry under the law. Why? Because it wasn't of the law. It was of grace. It needs to be divided because Jesus Christ himself, who is fully God, divided it himself. And it's been kept secret since the world began. But verse 26 says, but now, in the but now of the cross, by the way, it's made manifest or made known. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, has made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. That changes something about verse Chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, in Matthew, does it not? Are you going to go out and be obedient to Satan's Christianity and carry on the gauntlet of going out and teaching all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teach all that I have commanded thee, and lo, I will be with you, said Jesus Christ to these 11 apostles. But here... You should go out now, and it's manifested to all nations to the obedience of just one thing, faith. There's nothing in here about teaching anything else, and it sure has nothing to do with baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Can you see that? It just says, for the obedience of faith. Now, let's go to uh, Ephesians. Now, Ephesians... It's an important message here because it's in the Greek it's called the notes, the oneness of the Spirit of God. Because, in fact, before I give you that, I'm going to give you 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Like I said, you're going to get loaded of scripture today in this video. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. Compare this to Satan's Christianity that is full of controversy. It's full of arguments. It's full of debates. It's full of divisions. It's full of confusion. But listen to what uh, chapter 3, verse 16 says. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God is manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of the angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. End of story. Now, going back to the book of Ephesians, let's go to chapter 4 of Ephesians. And I'm going to read you verses 1 through 6. Now, this is the unity of the Spirit of God, not the flesh of mankind, not the flesh of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry called the gospel of the kingdom. This is of the Spirit of God. No flesh belongs here whatsoever. This is in the but now of the cross. This is in the doctrine for the body of Christ church from Romans to Philemon. Look what it says, starting in verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Verse 2. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this is Spirit is capitalized, so it's the Spirit of God. We are to keep it. We are not to create it. We are not to try and bring out a new unity by splitting away from an old denomination and creating our new one. That's not unity. That's division. Here he says, you keep something I've already created. And here is the unity he wants the body of Christ church to be. Verse 4, there is one body. That's the body of Christ. And one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Even as you are called in one hope of your calling, your salvation by rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Verse 6, and one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. One faith, ladies and gentlemen. There's not a Lutheran faith, a Catholic faith, a Presbyterian faith, a, a Pentecostal faith, Assembly of God faith, a Jehovah Witness faith, a Mormon faith. Get the picture? It's Jesus Christ's faith. He's talking about here, there's one faith, it's Jesus Christ. And you can back it out up with scripture. You can go to uh, a good verse to look at is uh, chapter 2 of uh, Galatians, I believe it is, verse 20. And let's just back that up. Let's go to the book of Galatians. Chapter 2, verse 20 says this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith 
of the Son of God. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the one faith he's talking about here. The baptism he's talking about here is a spiritual baptism. There's nothing about water in here, yet your Satan's Christianity puts it in there. They have to bring the law into the grace, and they have to take grace and try to pry it into the law, because that's what Satan's Christianity is all about. And that's why he has you blinded, and he'll keep you captive until you leave this earth in his damnation. He himself is in already, but he wants to take you with him. He will never change this. This is why I get so tired of listening to people tell me they're born-again Christians and they're members of the body of Christ Church and all this stuff that they do and all the scriptures that they know, and yet it is all words of no profit, even though they are giving you scripture. They're giving you scripture from a false pretense of Satan's Christianity. It's watered down. It's changed. It's not the truth of the word of God coming from God himself. It's coming from Satan. And if it's coming from Satan, he is the father of lies. And anytime he talks, it is a lie because there's no truth in him. In God, there's nothing but truth. It's impossible for God to lie. He has the strength. That's what that word impossible means there. Not Satan. Satan is the father of lies. Now, you see the difference? You see what's happening when uh, Satan's Christianity gets hold of you? Through a denomination, through generations of your families that have been Lutherans all their lives. They've been Catholics all their lives. They've been Presbyterians all their lives. They've been Pentecostals all their lives. They've been Mormons all their lives. And on and on. They've been Jehovah's Witnesses all their lives. It goes on and on and on. Even the non-denominational churches that pop up on every street corner in this world today. Of the more than 1,200 denominations in this world, the over 80,000 versions of the word of God that are out there today, is there any unity in Satan's Christianity? And that very much answer is absolutely not. There's only unity within the body of Christ church, which is not of this world. You see, that's why we do not have to be born again of the Spirit, and of the flesh, because we're not going to be of the flesh. There is no flesh in us. We are going to have a celestial body because we are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. These people aren't going to inherit anything. They're going to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. A big, big difference. The law said to them, you will be able to enter into the kingdom of God, if you do all these things that I tell you to do for your soul salvation to endure to the end. And you can read about soul salvation in 1 Peter. Chapter 4, I think it is, or maybe it's chapter 1, verse 9. Just look it up. It's not that big a book. But he talks about soul salvation enduring to the end. And then Jesus Christ talks about enduring unto the end when he talked about soul salvation in Matthew chapter 24, please read it. He doesn't talk about soul salvation. Paul never mentions anything about soul salvation and during to the end of anything. He says, the minute you believeth, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of the promise when you heard and trusted and first believed the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And the only way you can be saved out of the snare of the devil who's holding you captive through his Satan's Christianity is to believe the gospel, but not in vain, and to hear the gospel from God's word and not Satan's Christianity. And I'm going to give that to you right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. It says this, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, <clears throat> excuse me, where, which also you have received and wherein ye stand, verse 2, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered first of all unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And verse 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And let's add in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, because it's imperative to you understand 
You believe by faith and faith alone. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. The obedience of faith. We read about that somewhere else, didn't we? Chapter 20, 16, verse 26 of Romans. He says, For by grace are, are ye saved through faith, not, and that, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So don't be going around being born again, getting water baptized, keeping the law, and listening to Satan's Christianity by mixing law and grace, because you will be confused because God is not the author of confusion. That is said in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But he says in verse 9, And not of works, lest any man should boast. Wow. And yet, Satan's Christianity has people blinded and held captive by him at his will. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that? If you are, according to God's word now, a Christian, a professing Christian, a practicing Christian that belongs to a Christian church of a Christian denomination and are under the realm of this religion of Christianity that you think you're following the Jesus of Christianity of the Bible, you are really following Satan's Christianity because Christianity isn't even of Scripture, ladies and gentlemen. I will tell you that over and over and over again. It's a man-made word. It is found by the flesh and blood and sin of mankind and Satan's Christianity will hold you captive until the great white throne judgment. You'll end up in hell before that. And then you'll end up in the lake of fire for eternity because you wanted to obey your Christianity. It looked so good on the surface, didn't it? But the lie is not going to be exposed to you if you don't decide to believe what it is you want to believe and you have the right to believe whatever it is. But if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the uh salvation message of grace through faith by the finished work of the cross that Jesus Christ poured out to you and believe the gospel that was presented to you, you'll be saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. You'll be free from all that. Your eyes will be opened. Trust me, your mind will be opened. You will no longer be blinded by the God of this world and you will receive the acknowledging the repentance unto the acknowledgement of the truth because God will give it to you because you're seeking it through rightly dividing the word of truth, which is approved of by God, not Satan and not man. But again, it's your choice. It is your salvation that's at stake. Your eternal life is at stake. Not just this temporary life that's on this earth, but the eternal life. And you can have a choice. You can be in eternal damnation or you can be in eternal heavens with Jesus Christ and be part of the body of Christ Church and be saved by grace through faith. It's up to you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate you listening. This is a home Bible study. My home to your home. This is Robert Holler thanking you. And always remember, not until next time.